Hello, welcome to The Domino Effect. Today I would like to share a beautiful story about Domino over here. I always get asked, how did you get Domino or why did you get Domino? And so I wanted to share that story. So I created The Domino Effect in 2016 as an idea and I turned it into an LLC in 2018. And when I was approaching um, the, the end of COVID, I decided that I wanted to get a Boston Terrier because he's, they're black and white and my logo was black and white. And I knew that I didn't want to get a dog from a breeder. I knew I wanted to get a dog that was from a rescue because I wanted to practice what I preach with the domino effect and um, basically deliver kindness to an animal that needed someone to love them and be patient with them and work on some of the issues that a lot of rescue dogs have. So. I got really, really lucky, and the summer of 2021, I had a girlfriend named Katie, and she worked for Paws Chicago. She got a job, and she was in the um, medical division at Paws Chicago. She um, and called me and told me how excited she was to have that position, and she was so happy, and she called me sometime in the summer, and I took that information, and it was kind of marinating with me for a while, and I called her one day in October. And I said, Katie, I remember that you're working for Paws Chicago, and I wanted to call you and ask you if you ever get any Boston Terriers. I have a goal to work with a Boston Terrier and have him work with the domino effect with me to accomplish some goals that I have. But I know that it's hard to find purebred dogs when at rescues, and so I know they're usually you know mutts. So I thought, I'm probably not going to get lucky, but I'm just putting it out there. And I had no time frame. I said, no rush. Just whenever you get one, give me a call. I would love to come and, and, and meet the dog. So Katie responded and said, surprisingly to me, she said, Jennifer, I actually had a Boston Terrier here a couple of weeks ago. He's gone, but he was here. And I said, oh, okay, well, that's good news. I said, well, again, next year, three months, six months, whenever, just call me and let me know when you get another one. So <clears throat> this was in, in uh, middle of October. She calls me four days later and she says, Jen, do you remember that Boston Terrier I told you about? I said, yes, I do. She said, he's back. And I said, oh my gosh, well, what happened? She goes, well, we have a program here at the medical division. And I didn't know a lot about PAWS. I knew a little bit, but I learned a lot about PAWS from this experience. Apparently PAWS has two locations. They have the adoption center on Clybourne and then they have another place um, that is the medical um, center. And that's where all the dogs go first. And so when they go there, they have to pass all these tests and they try to find out certain things that are wrong with them that they need to fix before they become adaptable. So then once they heal and they treat their illnesses or challenges, then they can go to the Clybourne Center where they're allowed to be adapted. But prior to that, they don't allow people to adapt the animals. And so they're fostered while they're getting healed. And so that particular year, in 2021, I understand that they passed this cool program that got approved, and it was called Help Me Heal. And what that program does is it allows for Paw Chicago to have more cages in their medical center open up because the dogs are taken and put into foster care while they're healing with their illness. Because prior to this program, they would stay in the crate, and then they would, be, they would run out of space, and they couldn't do as much good work as they do. So... Basically, Domino was, his name was Nell at the time, and he was part of the Help Me Heal program. He had heartworms, and so <clears throat> they were treating him for the heartworms. So um, this little man here <laughs> um, had to finish his heartworm treatment, and he had to then get tested for microfilaria, which are tiny um, heartworms. And basically, until he tested clean and didn't have microfilaria, then he was and it was, it's a NATS test that, they, that they, um, they give the uh, animal. And so basically then he would be able to be adaptable. So I took Domino home. He stayed with me for two months. And around December 20th, he, right before Christmas, they called me at uh, pause and said, Jennifer, his microfilaria test came out clean. He's no longer got heartworms. He's now adaptable. And they gave me first dibs on adopting him. So at that point, he and I had spent about two months together. And we bonded tremendously, and I fell in love with this little man. 
and um, basically I, I chose to adopt him. So that is my story of how I found Domino, where he came from, what his journey is. He has a lot of different challenges that we work on, um, and they're not easy, but we work on them. But he's super friendly now and super lovely and um, much more comfortable than he was when I first met him because he came from an abuse situation and he had a lot of fear and was not comfortable with people. And so we worked on that tremendously and we have overcome quite a few things. So we're still working on a few things, but he's a great dog and he's enjoying his Instagram page for the Domino Effect and he's got a wardrobe that's super impressive. So you can look out for his uh, fashion show uh, on Instagram and all his positive affirmations and good messages. You're broken down and tired of living life on the merry-go-round. And you can't find a fighter, but I see it in you, so we can walk it out. Move mountains, we can walk it out and move. I'll be speaking to a very special guest today. This is Jason. Sorry. Jason. So Jason, tell us uh, what you do. You're, you're an entrepreneur. You own your own company. Tell us all about that. I do. Thank you for having me. I, um, I'm the uh, owner of a janitorial residential company. Um, it's Seasonal Home Care. We're a window and gutter cleaning company. Um, primarily all residential, but we will accept um, commercial jobs as they come. Um, some associations and things like that where we do all the buildings for the gutter cleaning or power wash, you know, some of the buildings and things like that. So we will take commercial jobs as they come, but it's primarily uh, residential. Um, we've been doing this since 2007 when I opened up uh, my own company. It has not been easy. Um, the initial years that we started, um, I was an owner operator. So the difference is that I was literally working from 7.30 in the morning, going and doing my own jobs, coming home, sitting in front of a computer and a phone, and making my own phone calls and trying to book my own jobs, and then doing this all over every single day, Monday through Saturday. It's tough sometimes. People don't realize that you can go and open up your own company, but where are you going to get the customers from? Where are you going to you know, get the money, to coming, that, the money that's coming in? How do you do that? It's, it's, it's a struggle. It definitely is. And um, I didn't realize that in the beginning, but thankfully we're still here, um, what, 15, 16 years later, and we're still going strong. So I'm blessed for that. And um, yeah, it hasn't been easy, but we're still here. We have over 25,000 repeat customers now. Uh, I don't have to go on out and do the work anymore, thank goodness, because that was really uh, <laughs> taxing, um, to say the least. So uh, I hire employees, uh, technicians out in the field, independent contractors, employees here that uh, do the marketing in-house for us, and we book our jobs. Um, and we assign them to our technicians daily, Monday through Saturday, and they go on out and service our customers' homes. Nice. So I can appreciate what you're saying about gaining customers, obtaining them, retaining them. And um, what people don't realize a lot of times, if they're an employee and they're not part of the, the process A to Z in business, and they just work in like one department in particular, like accounting or possibly sales or possibly customer service, the issue is momentum. So like when you first started, that is an issue is when you spend a lot of time prospecting in business and you're prospecting, prospecting, and now you have clients and then you service them, you servicing them personally as the owner takes away time from prospecting. Correct. Right? So Absolutely. your momentum, you lose the momentum. Uh, well, right? yeah, and then you have to literally, you have to try to keep the momentum going. Yeah. Um, and that's that's taxing, and it's very it's 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 a hard thing to do. Um, you you always want to say what do they say? Uh, acquisition, um, uh, retention yeah. over acquisition. So yeah. um, you want to retain your customers. You want to keep your customers happy so that they continue to com keep coming back. For sure. Um, and then there's the other side, which is the acquisition, and that's obviously the more um, the more hard part about getting new customers and going about keeping those customers. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And when you take a break to service the customers that you were prospecting last week, now you don't have any prospecting going on because you're servicing, and then you have to go back to prospecting. 
so that you can service a new one, you know, and it's just a so, vicious cycle of momentum that's needed. Absolutely. Sure. And luckily for me and the service uh, industry that we, we do is uh, we have a lot of different services that we can offer uh, where we can offer each service to each one of our customers at different times of the season. So, um, you know, primarily window and gutter cleaning are done in the, um, in the spring and in fall. So they're going to need us twice a year. Um, it is, our, our service is kind of a luxury service. So um, if the customer wants to have their house power washed or if they need the windows cleaned, um, you know, they can choose whether it's in the budget or not. So when I say that it's an, uh, a luxury service, um, people have to decide whether they need us or they just want us. Okay, that makes sense for sure. So that is, you've just told us about what your company is called, what you do, um, how long you've been in business, right? When you started it. And I have such an interest in your backstory and how you came into doing this, um, what your history and your past is, because there's always a story behind every entrepreneur, because being an entrepreneur is not easy. And if you stick it out and you enter that industry, there's a reason to enter an entrepreneurial, an entrepreneurial um, journey. And there is always a tenacity that you have to have to stay doing it because it's hard. And so usually I find that it's always something, if you dig deep <clears throat> about an entrepreneur, that explains it all. So if you can take us back in time and let us know some of the things that your history has experienced. Um, you, you're absolutely right when it comes to reasoning. Um, I have a background, um, uh, a criminal background. And it's not something that I shy away from talking about because it is me and it's who I am. And I've overcome that. Um, but coming out of that and deciding to go out and get a job and being, you know, pushed away or refused positions that I was uh, perfectly, you know, able to do um, was one thing that was a big struggle for me, which was like, okay, well, I could go get a job here or I can get a job there. And it wasn't making any of the bills get paid. Um, it needed more money. Obviously, that's a huge factor when it comes to opening a business. Um, I worked for a company that did exactly what I do now. That's the first job that I've ever had in my entire life, was working for a telemarketing company, booking window and gutter cleaning jobs. It's the same position that I hire for year-round now. Um, I did that for two years. I told the manager that I was tired and I don't want to do this anymore, so... They didn't want to lose me. At that point, I was incredibly good at what I was doing. Um, so they made me the dispatcher, and uh, I started to uh, dispatch to all the towns in the Chicagoland area. So I became very aware of where towns were and where my technicians lived. So I was able to get them their jobs where they, you know, in the same area that they live in. I did that for two years, and I was just tired of that too. So I, I went to the manager and said, um, I would like to do something else in this company. And thank goodness that there was still... Uh, um, uh, you know, room for advancement, and I, there was no glass ceiling at that point for me. Uh, they made me the manager, and I was literally taking care of the whole office, the telemarketers in the uh, in the in the back, and dealing with all their personalities and all their in you know everything that they need to get from their day to day positions. Uh, the technicians out in the field and the customers that were calling in and everything was just kind of um, put on my shoulders, which was a blessing because then it just kind of uh, prepared me for where I was going. Um, and that was to take the next step because uh, there was no other. At that point, there was a glass ceiling. I wasn't really going any higher than that. Um, uh, where I was able to just say, listen, I think I can do this on my own. Um, little did I know how difficult that was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I left the company and opened my own company and um, <clears throat> became an owner-operator. And that's how um, I became who I am today. Took many years, but uh, perseverance definitely paid off. Okay. And there is also a segment of your life prior to that, which is your childhood, sure which is. I think is very interesting. And I think it also is inspiring because 
I think that I personally come from a childhood of domestic violence. So I had a period of time from when I was 11 years old until I was about mm, 15, where there was a gentleman in our family's life who was a stepfather. And it took my mom about four years to get rid of him. And during those times, it was extremely hard. And so when I learned about your childhood and your history, I think there's a significance there, but also in why you have the tenacity you have or, or the desire you know, to be independent and, and, and be an entrepreneur. But I also think it's an inspirational story for other young people who may have, have a similar childhood or home environment that you experience. So I would love for you to share that with us. Yeah. Uh, another thing that I don't shy away from is uh, my, my upbringing. Um, it was not um, that great, uh, to say the least. Um, I grew up in Derby, Connecticut. Uh, most people would think of Connecticut as being, oh, you know, a uh, yuppity kind of uh, um, area and place, uh, not too far from uh, Yale. Um, so being that the, um, the state is so small, it is uh, known for the biggest heroin addiction in the country. Um, I did not know that. It is. Okay. Um, my father was a heroin addict. Um, I found out about that very early on in life, six and seven years old, where uh, I had to fend for myself, learning to um, either jump into a trash can and or, or, or a trash can and find cans so I can get money for uh, food. Um, so you would sell the cans. I would literally go to the store and deposit the cans, and and they were five cents a can, um, and I would take that money and go eat. So I had to fend for myself very early on in life. And Jason, where did you learn that? Like when you told me this story, I was like so amazed because I had, I had no idea that that was happening in the world. I didn't know that people were giving money for cans. Yeah. But how did you learn that? Well, you can just look on the top of any Coke can or any bottle. It says the re refund okay. um, amount for any uh, deposit. So you figured it out just by reading the can? I did. I did. Nobody taught you this. You just figured it out. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Because you were 11? How old were you? So I was, I did this for years while my father was head into his addiction. Um, I didn't, my father made me lie for him to my whole entire family who did not live in the state. Uh, at that time, I was living directly with him. Um, he made me lie to them to make it look like the situation was a lot better than what it was. Okay. And we lived with his father, which was my grandfather. And when he passed away, things got incredibly bad. The lights got turned off. The water got turned off. My dad went on, you know, week binges where I would just be there, just floating. Um, and that's when I really decided that I really needed to figure something out, and I decided to tell my family in the other state, in, in Illinois, as a matter of fact. Uh, and my mother flew right on out here to get me. And that so was give me um, a time between, frame. I was yeah. between like six to seven years old to about 11 years old. That okay. I was going through that wow. for that many years. Okay. So that's a lot. That is a lot. That of was time. a lot of time. Yeah. That was a lot of time for me. Um, upon coming out to Illinois, because I had to fend for myself so, so much, you know, previously, I got involved with the wrong crowd. You know, obviously then I was in a situation here in Illinois with, the gang populations out here were just so so terrible. So I got influenced by the wrong people here, which again continued, you know, the terrible situations. Jason, can I ask some questions about that right there? Sure. Okay. So you're a male in Naperville, okay? And this was in your, your what, 12 now? Yeah. What are you at? About, about 12. 12. 12 years yeah. old, right? And I know... Being a female, I know that <clears throat> it is so important growing up, especially in your impressionable years and your teenage years, to connect with a cousin, a sister, a mom, an aunt, somebody. Okay, as a female, you look for somebody that's going to be your role model or your mentor or the older person, okay, that's going to guide you and, and, and has gone through the path that you're going through prior to you. And so I can only imagine as a young man, you're here. You've been let down by your dad. You have no male figure, right? 
you didn't have an older brother, am I correct? I do have an older brother. You do. Okay. Was he around at all during these times? During my previous years, no. But okay. when I came to Illinois, yes. Okay. So your condition, though, you're in another state with no older brother. Correct. Right? Access to that brother. Okay. So I can only imagine that the way that gangs operate, this is, this is my assumption, okay, is that they probably prey and feed on young boys who are missing that father figure, older brother, uh, stability, uh, rock, you know, that probably young boys really need. Do you agree with that? I would have to absolutely agree with that. Okay. Uh, they give you the camaraderie that you're looking for. Um, they give you uh, your brotherhood. They give you um, things to keep you going. Um, and it, when you're in an impressionable time in your life like that, you need something, and that's missing. And that was missing for me. Um, didn't have any any upbringing that was, you know, directional. So I knew nothing. And my mother didn't really know what to do at that point with me. I was not. I was skipping school. I was not going to school. I was hanging out with the wrong people. At uh, at that point, I started doing drugs. Okay. And, um, of course you did, because yeah. that's the circuit, right? That's, and the, that's yeah. how they make money, gangs. Usually will peddle, peddle uh, narcotics. Am I correct? That's correct. So you have exposure to it, because if you're not peddling it, then you're using it. And it's usually hard to peddle it and not use it. Do you agree? I would have to uh, absolutely agree. Okay. So the um, you know best entrepreneur of a gang is the person who can peddle it and not use it. <laughs> <laughs> because the mixing the two <laughs> is, not a, is not good business, right? No. So, of course, I'm being funny, you know, and sarcastic here. But unfortunately, the point I'm making is when you start peddling it and then you're using it is when the disasters really start happening. That's exactly what happened. your mind and your body and your soul and your everything, right? So let's go, let's, let's so apply that, that that's, to you. That's exactly what happened in my life. Um, not only was I trying to sell drugs to make money, I was smoking them at the same time. Um, and the drugs didn't just get put in my hand for free. So I would have to sell them, bring the money back to them. Yes, it was fronted to me first because obviously I was a, a young man and did not really have any money to buy it and then try to sell it. And there was a time where I asked for more than I could handle, and I, I used it all. And then there was no money to pay for the drugs. Which, how which common do you to, think that is? What's that? How common do you think that is? That probably happens more often than anybody would think. Okay. Um, so now what do you do? So now you've now used you resort, all the products, you, you owe money. Crime. Okay. Now you resort to crime. You try to figure out ways to get the money to pay them, and then it's robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, and at that point in my life, I really didn't care. I had gotten away with just about everything that I was doing anyway, so... Uh, I didn't really care whether I was going to get caught or not. So I decided that I would rob my drug dealer. Wow. Okay, because you have to now, you have to uh, report to somebody with that money that you don't have. Correct. Okay, so your solution is you're going to rob. Yeah, I'm going to rob. And you I'm particularly rob robbed your drug dealer. Correct. <laughs> because you probably knew he had money. Well, I know he had money and I knew he had drugs. Okay. Oh, so, so you wanted both. I wanted both. Oh, wow. Okay. I okay. took a, a couple of the people that I knew very, very well, which, I mean, how do you really well do you know, you know people when you're 13 and 14 years old? Very impressionable and very, I, I don't know, stupid. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I went, I went and uh, I went through a window at 2 o'clock in the morning. Oh, someone's home. At someone's home. And who was in the home? His him, his family, his wife, and all hell broke, broke loose. Okay. Um, before I went in, um, I grabbed, a, you want to call it a stick, I guess, a, you know, some kind of club. And when we were going through the kitchen, he came out, there was a struggle, and I hit him with the club. Like a golf club? No, like a, 
like an axe handle. Wow. Okay. But it didn't have the metal piece on it. Okay. Uh, I think back to that now as an adult, and I thank God that that didn't go a different way, where that he would have died or something like that, or um, or if I would have died, he could have came out with a gun. You know, multiple different things. Outcomes. Could have, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, outcomes could have happened. But in your mind, you were thinking, oh, I'm going to go in the middle of the night because they're all sleeping. No one's going to hear because they're going to be in a deep sleep. I'm going to take the money. I'm going to take the drugs. I'm going to be in and out, and it's going to be done. Yeah. That's what the plan was. I mean, so. how, how I'm like child-minded is that? It's yeah. really, really ridiculous when you think of that as an adult, when you, you know, the mm -hmm. mentality going back. But, yeah, that's, that was that's the plan. how it was. I mean, yeah. there was no real, like, mastermind plan to this this was just the come on let's go get it and get out of there but were it didn't under, end up that way were you under the influence oh yeah mm -hmm. i mean i was getting high every single day i mean mm -hmm. but we're only talking about marijuana now i'm not minimizing marijuana you know but i am saying that i wasn't doing any um harder drugs than that okay but um, it altered your state oh, it definitely your, your, did. your the way you were thinking and the speed of your thoughts and all of that For good sure. stuff right okay mm -hmm. okay so then what happened? We ran out of there. Okay. We ran out of there, um, and we didn't get caught for about three weeks later. Wow. So during that three weeks, did you think that you were oh, in the yeah. clear? Uh, no, I was, I, was, uh, I was scared. I was very scared. Um, we were wearing masks. I mean, we had a walkie-talkie. I mean, it it was premeditated, okay. is the word that I was looking for. But it it was not master class criminal here. It was juvenile stupidity. And um, when the detectives came and talked to me, I didn't know what to say, so I kind of incriminated myself. Okay. Um, uh, ultimately, long story made short is uh, after going through court for a year, um, the state of Illinois charged me as an adult. Okay. They gave me juvenile life, which was 11 years, which I did five and a half, which I didn't get out until I was 21 years old. So you went in at how old? 15. 15. You got it at 21. I was two months before my 21st birthday. So you did six years, essentially. Five and a half. Five and a half. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you did five and a half years, and but you had 11, so... They gave me 50%. 50% for good right. time. So good time served, they cut it in half. Okay. Right. What, anybody who knows better knows that a, a home invasion is a class X felony. It's 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 an eighty five percent rule, and they give that to adults ninety five percent of the time. Eighty five percent. At the time when I was being sentenced, I thought they were throwing the book at me. It took me a long time to realize and stop the resentment when I actually got. I was I was graced with with uh, what you received. Yeah, I was definitely given mercy because I had three accounts of home invasion, six accounts of aggravated battery, uh, five accounts of residential burglary, two accounts of mob action, unlawful use of weapons. They threw every kind of uh, case at me they could to make it stick because the home invasions were for. Three accounts were like for him and his wife and his daughter, the residential burglaries. I mean, it just, it just, they just add it on. They tack it on as much as they can. And when I pleaded guilty, it was just one account of home invasion. But that, all those other cases, they follow you. Whenever your background is ran, those all come up. And then one account of home invasion is what you copped out for, what you, what you pled guilty to. So yeah, that was a, a traumatizing experience to be having the judge sentence you to that much time. When you're 15 years old, you're almost getting the same amount of time as you are old. Yeah. 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 Um, it took me about two and a half years to realize that I got a break. A two and a I half got, years? Yeah, I got So my, you're like have, now 23 years old-ish, right? No, you're no, out no. Of I was 17 in prison. Oh, in, oh, you in real, prison. Oh, wow. Okay. So now when you got out, like no, while you were in there, uh, you while realized. While I was in there, I, I, it took me a long time of just being very resentful and being wow. mad and feeling like I've been, like, like the book had been thrown at me, like I've been punished so terrible. 
well, you know, this is the first time I've ever had any kind of police contact. Um, but it was a terrible, terrible thing that I did. This man went through hell. You know, him and his family were tra are traumatized. They don't feel comfortable in their own home. You know what I mean? These yeah. things, this is, you know, their home is their sanctuary. You know what I mean? This is where they should feel comfortable. I took that away from them. And I, you know, I think about that all the time. Okay. But going through prison, coming out of prison, getting through it um, has made me into a, a better man after I was able to realize that um, I'm not sure if I should say God, you know, gave me exactly what I deserve to make me not turn that corner and go back to any kind of crime or, you know, repetitious behavior moving forward in my life. Because you learned your lesson. I learned what you I needed to You did not to want to do that again. I don't ever, go through you know, that again. Yeah, right. So what I'm saying is, like, I, I could have gotten maybe a better deal, but who knows if I would have gotten out and just felt like, oh, well. That wasn't a big deal. Yeah, that's not terrible. You well, know, let me try this again. Yeah, I went through yeah. that. I could get, you know, I could. That was not the case with me. I was like, okay, that's enough. Yep. I mean, that was a long time, but I feel like in my heart, what I needed was that much time to be able to say. And when I came out, we started. I started having children and and bettering my life and and just becoming a better man in general. Nice. So those things are those attributes are what brought me to being uh, an entrepreneur in turn because coming out of prison trying to take care of a family, no one hires for those kind of positions for the money that you need yeah. to be able to maintain that kind of a life and be able to take care of your family. And that's what drove me, gave me the, uh, the will to do that. And I understand like now while you're running your company, you try your best that if somebody is genuine and authentic and came from a similar situation, you try your best to help them. I have. So, I have yeah. always done that. Yep. Which is really nice. There, You're like paying it forward almost. Co correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, we, have, um, we have many um, convicts or, you know, parolees that, that come out of prison. Um, their probation officers help them try to find positions. And I've been called by probation officers to hire. Would you give this person a chance if they're out of prison? And I've been able to, when I was a manager at that company prior to me opening up my own shop, um, I've been able to make that decision without even consulting with the owner because he trusted in me that I would make the right decisions. And I always have said yes. And that's actually happened twice while I was the manager over there. Um, and good people are could come through and out of that. I'm one of them to attest to it. Yeah. So that's why I feel compassionate yeah. and, and able to do that. I hope that given... Um, the chance and opportunity that these people would, you know, reciprocate and do the right thing. And that ties totally right back into my domino effect. Um, it's important, I think, to have the appreciation when something is granted to you and allow for the next person to I, have I that same opportunity. And agree I with loved, you a million percent. I loved your story. I loved when we talked about this. It just hit me very close to home. And there were so many portions of your journey that were very impressive to me and are very impactful. And the Domino Effect slogan is make an impact. Yeah. And so I love meeting people of impact. And I just thought every single layer of your story was very awesome. And I just thank you for being transparent with me prior to the interview. Thank you for sharing this with me because a lot of the stuff you shared is super personal and people are very private about. Um, Am I right? Do you agree? Uh, absolutely. I, I, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that most people wouldn't feel comfortable. Hundred percent. But it, but again, it's it's a journey, you know, that we all have to. We all have our own journeys that we deal with in life. Um, I became comfortable with mine because I've overcome it. From from a very young age, I've had a, a you know struggle. I struggled. Um, not always because of myself, but again, overcoming is the is the um, the way that I look at you know becoming successful. For sure.
for sure. Well, thank you, Jason, so much. Is there anything that you want to add? No, thank you so much for having me on the show. Okay, thank you so much. You're broken down and tired of living life on the merry-go-round. And you can't find a fight.